my gosh. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to be here and thank you for coming to listen to all of us. Um, <clears throat> in many ways, what I would like to talk about is sort of the grand departure. And what I'm calling the grand departure is essentially the phenomenon of human social cultural evolution and you were just hearing about it. And you've, you've heard about it in different ways all day long, about the fact that people were able to internalize things as they grew up and had experiences, shift those things in their head and create something new, whether it was music, whether it was a different way to be in sport, whether it was to get out of a situation in your life. All of these things are examples of changes and departures from the inertia of who you are. And one of the great things about human species is that we have this remarkable organ, the brain, as you heard, that allows us to take the accumulated experiences of thousands of previous generations, internalize it in a relatively short period of time, take that content, manipulate it, reflect on it, and invent new things. So think about it, 50,000 years ago, human beings were genetically roughly equivalent to the way we are now. Can you imagine what, if we brought someone from that era and had them sit here and listen to what was going on today? I mean, it's astounding the trajectory of invention that has occurred with our species. It's a process that is allowed by the brain. As you heard earlier, the human brain really is the most unique gift of our species. It is so unique because it's able to absorb content so rapidly. And, and, and store this content. There's wonderful things about the way the brain's organized is that certain gifts that we have that have allowed us to sort of invent who we are. And so much of what we do every day, you know, the, the clothes we wear, the language we speak, the way we raise our children, all these technologies, these are complete inventions. We invented these. There's no genetics for English, no genetics for Japanese, there are genetic capabilities that allow us to make associations between patterns of neural activity that co-occur. So when we see something and we hear something, we can connect those. Our brain makes these incredible associations and we do this in the billions. And we do this more effectively than any other species and that's why we, generation after generation after generation, invent our own future. And part of what I want to do today in my 14 minutes is make you all think a little bit about some of the things that you should take into consideration as you invent your future and contribute to the social cultural trajectory of our species. Because make no mistake about it, what you put in your brain and what we put in the brains of our children, the way we raise them, the way we educate them, the choices we make about what we put into their heads changes the trajectory of the species. And part of what I want you to understand is that, you know, e this inventing process has limits. You know, we've done all kinds of things. We, we are so adaptable, but we have stretched the limits of our genetics in ways that I think are destructive. Not everything we've invented is good. Racism is not good. Misogyny is not good. But we've invented it and we pass it on, generation after generation after generation. We've invented child rearing practices that are not good. We've invented educational models that are not biologically respectful, that literally fight our biology. Sitting on your butts for 45 minutes or two hours or six hours and not moving and not touching and not relating to other people is dysregulating, it's non-rhythmic, and it literally puts you in a position where you are inefficiently going to be able to internalize any cognitive content. We can also lose the accumulated wisdom of thousands of generations. You know, we're not the only smart generation. In fact, we're doing a lot of really stupid things. 
So what I want to do, I'm going to take a few minutes and talk to you about a couple of these really important gifts of our genetics that when we do this inventing process in synchrony with our biology, we see quantum leaps in productivity, creativity, invention, and in humanity. But when we do the inventing process at odds with our biology, we lose, we're inefficient, we spend money, effort, energy, and we don't get where we want. So, these two gifts, you've heard a lot about the relational gift. Human beings are fundamentally relational creatures. Every single part of your brain, every single part of your skin, your face, your eyes are dedicated to forming and maintaining relationships because the truth is it wasn't our brains that kept us alive, it was our collective brains that kept us alive. We survived because we were able to work together, cooperative hunting, cooperative sharing of things that we gathered. It was the relational capability of the brain that allowed us to survive, and it is the relational capability of the brain that continues to give us our best gifts, reward and regulation. Your stress response systems and your neuro, the neurobiological networks that give you pleasure, both of those are intimately connected to the relational neurobiology. You feel most rewarded and you feel safest when you are with people who you love and respect. And when you are dysregulated, you can't learn, and you get phys physically ill, and when you are not being rewarded through relational things, through healthy things, you get rewarded through Oreo cookies, right? Anybody read the, the, the study yesterday? You get rewarded from drugs of abuse. So, let's talk about these things. 50,000 years ago, on this planet, Human beings lived in multi-generational, multi-family groups. There were grandmas and aunties and babies all in the same space. There was more touch, more eye contact, more conversation. There was a relational milieu that literally fed the brain in this incredibly rich way. The best way to get cognitive content into your brain, to learn things, to learn math, is in rhythm and in relationship. Those of you who know anything about science, not that I'm assuming you do, but those of you who do will appreciate this. When you teach a class where there's 30 kids and one teacher, a topic, you get a certain uptake of that content. If you take a child and you teach that same content to them one-on-one -on -one with a tutor, there's a two sigma shift in the uptake of that content. In other words, the dumbest kid, the kid who had the hardest time, the most struggles with learning that content, would actually learn the content more efficiently in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, more efficiently than the person who was at the top of the class. We have invented a world that is relationally different than the world our brain prefers. The size of the human living group has shifted. We've gone from having 30 or 40 people in continuous relational interaction to a world where there's fewer than three people in the average household, and those people are watching television most of the time, and they're not having conversation. And when they leave that environment, they're going out into the world where they're educated in an environment where there's 30 kids and one teacher. And everybody knows what happens when you have a phone and you text and you tweet. The relational environment is changing. The relational landscape of the world, we're more mobile, we move away from our families. We've invented all kinds of great stuff, but the unintended consequences of our inventing process means we have our own home in a brand new community and our own room and in our own room, our own TV. We're not having family meals. We're not having touch. We don't have people in our lives. We have 1,000 friends on Facebook and not one single person to have dinner with. We have created a poverty of relationships that is much worse than the poverty of material things. I'm not a fan of being poor. But I'll tell you what, if I had my choice, it's much rather, I'd much rather have somebody have wealth of relationships and poverty of material goods than have lots of material goods and poverty of relationships. Oh, thank you very much. Why is the relational milieu important? The relational milieu is important because it is in context of relationships early in life and throughout life that we literally 
change our physiology. I talked about this. Your stress response is essentially regulated by relational interactions. And if you have relational poverty, you walk around as a dysregulated person. You're more vulnerable to trauma, you're less capable of dealing with transition and novelty, and it's harder to learn new things. Literally, when you interact with somebody, when you look in their eyes and you touch them and you have a conversation, your physiology changes and their physiology changes both for the better. And if you look at the way people are living now, you look at the fact that these systems in our brain, you know, you've got a part of your brain when it, that, that allows you to read and write. You've got a part of your brain that allows you to move your hands in a certain way. And so all of these parts of the brain, we know, develop and change in a use-dependent way. The more you use them, the better they get. And this is true about relational health. It's true about the part of your brain that allows you to form and maintain relationships, the part of your brain that allows you to be humane, the part of your brain that builds compassion. And so here's the number of relational interactions of a typical child over the course of a day. And the little arrows to the inner circle are interactions with family. And as you go out, it's friends, and then it's with acquaintances. And you see this child has relational interaction, reward, regulation, reward. And this is a child who's in a high-risk environment in foster care. This child is literally living in relational poverty. There is, he's starving for reward, he's starving for relationship, making him much more vulnerable. And the truth is, if you understand how the brain works, if you understand the fact that in order for you to be empathic, in order for you to be compassionate, in order for you to love, you have to have been loved. You have to have a certain number of relational interactions to fully express your capacity to be humane. And we have created a world that is inducing a form of relational poverty. A tiny little 30 second lesson on the de development of the brain. Let's talk about this. The brain develops as a reflection of the world it grows up in. You heard about that earlier. But the vast majority of the organization of the brain doesn't take place at 15 to 25. It takes place in the first three years of life. By the time your brain it, by the time you're four years old, your brain is about 85% the size it is when you're an adult. The foundational structures that you will use to form and maintain relationships are in place early, early in life. Now, you can modify the brain, the brain changes, but what happens is if you have poverty of experience early in life, it changes your brain in profound ways that are hard to catch up with later on. This is a drawing of a boy who had three years of neglect in an Eastern European orphanage and then was adopted by a loving family. Five years of intensive loving services was unable to catch him up to the point where he was normal by the time he was eight. And this is what happens. The brain on the right, obviously smaller and different. The brain on the left, a normal three-year-old child. The child on the right was raised in a cage, much less touch, much less opportunity for motor activity, much less relational interaction. The brain changes as a reflection of experience. Poverty of relationships means abnormalities in the brain. And we have created a world, the modern world, where we have essentially induced a form of institutional, social, cultural, relational poverty. It's neglect. The average child now grows up in an environment where they get about 1 24th the number of relational interactions that a child would get 50,000 years ago if they lived in a hunter-gatherer clan. So there are parts of our brains, all of us, where our capacity to be fully humane and compassionate and fully relational skilled are being unexpressed. And if we don't address this, if we don't change this, we will not be able to depart from the trajectory we are on, which is not a good trajectory. The next great departure for the human species is when we and when you understand that this inventing process, that your process of development, your process of child rearing, your process of choosing what is in the educational curriculum and how we educate people incorporates the wisdom of our own biology. We are relationally respectful, we recapture relational health, and we value early childhood. 
Whenever human beings have created policy, practice, or law that's biologically respectful, we've had quantum leaps in productivity and humanity and invention. We have to depart from our current trajectory. We have to recapture relationships, and we have to value the power of early childhood. And I'm going to end on this slide and just point out one thing that we need to remedy. You've been here all day long. The organ that allows you to be creative and productive and humane is the brain. And the way the brain changes is in context of experiences, particularly relational experiences, but it's much more malleable early in life than it is later in life. If you look at the curve uh, that goes from the top down like this and it says the brain's capacity to change, that's basically how easy it is to influence the brain. And then you look at how we're spending dollars on programs to change the brain, you see this incredible mismatch between opportunity and investment. And in the inventing process, those of you who are involved in that, as we are all in some way, if we don't capitalize on our relational health and on the power of early childhood, we will not be able to fully meet the potential of the human species. If we do act on this, things that we can't even yet envision will take place. And I would encourage all of you to recognize that it is in context of relationships, and you heard it in multiple ways today. It's been relationships that have made the difference in these people's lives, and it will be relationships in your lives that will make the difference as well. So thank you for the opportunity, and go be good and go be great. Thank you.